Chapter 3 The Money Manipulators Many college history professors tell their charges that the books they will be using in the class are objective. But stop and ask yourself, is it possible to write a history book without a particular point of view? There are billions of events which take place in the world each day. To think of writing a complete history of a nation covering even a year is absolutely incredible. Not only is a historian's ability to write an objective history limited by the sheer volume of happenings, but by the fact that many of the most important happenings never appear in the papers or even in somebody's memoirs. The decisions reached by the big boys in the smoke-filled rooms are not reported even in the New York Times, which ostensibly reports all the news that is fit to print. All the news that fits is a more accurate description. In order to build his case, a historian must select a minuscule number of facts from the limited number that are known. If he does not have a theory, how does he separate important facts from unimportant ones? As Professor Stuart Crane has pointed out, this is why every book proves the author's thesis. But no book is objective. No book can be objective, and this book is not objective. Liberal reviewers should have a ball quoting that out of context. The information in it is true, but the book is not objective. We have carefully selected the facts to prove our case. We believe that other, most other historians have focused on the landscape and ignored that which is most important, the cart, boy, and donkey. Most of the facts which we bring out are readily verifiable at any large library, but our contention is that we have arranged these facts in the order which most accurately reveals their true significance in history. These are the facts the establishment does not want you to know. Have you ever had the experience of walking into a mystery movie two-thirds of the way through? Confusing, wasn't it? All the evidence made it look as if the butler were the murderer, but in the final scenes you find out, surprisingly, that it was the man's wife all along. You, will, you have to stay and see the beginning of the film. Then, as all of the pieces fall into place, the story makes sense. This situation is very similar to the one in which millions of Americans find themselves today. They are confused by current happenings in the nation. They have come in as the movie, so to speak, is going into its conclusion. The earlier portion of the mystery is needed to make the whole thing understandable. Actually, we are not really starting at the beginning, but we are going back far enough to give meaning to today's happenings. In order to understand the conspiracy, it is necessary to have some rudimentary knowledge of banking, and, particularly, of international bankers. While it would be an oversimplification to ascribe the entire conspiracy to international bankers, they none nevertheless have played a key role. Think of the conspiracy as a hand with one finger labeled international banking, others, foundations, the anti-religion movement, Fabian socialism, and communism. But it was the international bankers of whom Professor Quigley was speaking when we quoted him earlier as stating that their aim was nothing less than control of the world through finance. Where do governments get the enormous amounts of money they need? Most, of course, comes from taxation. But governments often spend more than they are willing to tax from their citizens, and so are forced to borrow. Our national debt is now $455 billion, every cent of it borrowed at interest from somewhere. The public is led to believe that our government borrows from the people through savings bonds. Actually, only the smallest percentage of the national debt is held by individuals in this form. Most government bonds, except those owned by the government itself through its trust funds, are held by vast banking firms known as international banks. For centuries, there has been big money to be made by international bankers in the financing of governments and kings. Such operators are faced, however, with certain thorny problems. We know that smaller banking operations protect themselves by taking collateral. But what kind of collateral can you get from a government or a king? What if the banker comes to collect and the king says, off with his head? The process through which one collects a debt from a government or a monarch is not a subject taught in the business schools of our universities, and most of us, never having been in the business of financing kings, have never given the problem much thought. But there is a king financing business, and to those who can ensure collection it is lucrative indeed. Economics professor Stuart Crane notes that there are two means used to collateralize loans to governments and kings. Whenever a business firm borrows big money, its cre creditor obtains a voice in management to protect his investment. 
Like a business, no government can borrow big money unless willing to surrender to the creditor some measure of sovereignty as collateral. Certainly, international bankers who have loaned hundreds of billions of dollars to governments around the world command considerable influence in the policies of such governments. But the ultimate advantage the creditor has over the king or president is that if the ruler gets out of line, the banker can finance his enemy or rival. Therefore, if you want to stay in the lucrative king financing business, it is wise to have an enemy or rival waiting in the wings to unseat every king or president to whom you lend. If the king doesn't have an enemy, you must create one. Preeminent in playing this game was the famous House of Rothschild, its founder, Mayor Amschel Rothschild, 1743-1812, of Frankfurt, Germany, kept one of his five sons at home to run the Frankfurt Bank and sent the others to London, Paris, Vienna, and Naples. The Rothschilds became incredibly wealthy during the 19th century by financing governments to fight each other. According to Professor Stuart Crane, if you will look back at every war in Europe during the 19th century, you will see that they always ended with, with the establishment of a balance of power. With every reshuffling, there was a balance of power in a new grouping around the House of Rothschild in England, France, or Austria. They grouped nations so that if any king got out of line, a war would break out, and the war would be decided by which way the financing went. Researching the debt positions of the warring nations will usually indicate who was to be punished. Describing the characteristics of the Rothschilds and other major international bankers, Dr. Quigley tells us that they remained different from ordinary bankers in several ways. They were cosmopolitan and international. They were close to government and were particularly concerned with government debts, including foreign government debts. These bankers came to be called international bankers. Quigley, Tragedy and Hope, page 52. One major reason for the historical blackout on the role of the international bankers in political history is that the Rothschilds were Jewish. Anti-Semites have played into the hands of the conspiracy by trying to portray the entire conspiracy as Jewish. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The traditionally Anglo-Saxon J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller international banking institutions have played a key role in the conspiracy. But there is no denying the importance of the Rothschilds and their s satellites. However, it is just as unreasonable and immoral to blame all Jews for the crimes of the Rothschilds as, is, as it is to hold all Baptists accountable for the crimes of the Rockefellers. The Jewish members of the conspiracy have used an organization called the Anti-Defamation League as an instrument to try to convince everyone that any mention of the Rothschilds or their allies is an attack on all Jews. In this way, they have stifled almost all honest scholarship on international bankers and made the subject taboo within universities. Any individual or book exploring the subject is immediately attacked by hundreds of ADL committees all over the country. The ADL has never let truth or logic interfere with its highly professional smear jobs. When no evidence is apparent, the ADL, which staunchly opposes so-called McCarthyism, accuses people of being latent anti-Semites. Can you imagine how they would yell and scream if someone accused them of being latent communists? Actually. Nobody has a right to be more angry at the Rothschild clique than their fellow Jews. The Warburgs, part of the Rothschild Empire, helped finance Adolf Hitler. There were few, if any, Rothschilds or Warburgs in the Nazi prison camps. They set out the war in luxurious hotels in Paris or immigrated to the United States or England. As a group, Jews have suffered most at the hands of these power seekers. The Rothschild has much more in common with a Rockefeller than he does with a tailor from Budapest or the Bronx. Since the keystone of the international banking empires has been government bonds, it has been in the interest of these international bankers to encourage government debt. The higher the debt, the more the interest. Nothing drives government deeply into debt like a war. It has not been an uncommon practice among international bankers to finance both sides of the bloodiest military conflicts. For example, during our Civil War, the North was financed by the Rothschilds through the American agent August Belmont, and the American South through the Erlangers, Rothschild's relatives. But while wars and revolutions have been useful to international bankers in gaining or increasing control over governments, the key to such control has always been control of money. You can control a government if you have in your debt a creditor is in a position to demand the privileges of monopoly from the sovereign. Money-seeking governments have granted monopolies in state banking, natural resources, 
oil concessions and transportation. However, the monopoly which the international financiers most covet is control over a nation's money. Eventually, these international bankers actually owned as private corporations the central banks of the various European nations. The Bank of England, Bank of France, and Bank of Germany were not owned by their respective governments, as almost everyone imagines, but were privately owned monopolies granted by the heads of state, usually in return for loans. Under this system, observed Reginald McKenna, president of the Midlands Bank of England, those that create and issue the money and credit direct the policies of government and hold in their hands the destiny of the people. Once the government is in debt to the bankers, it is as at their mercy. A frightening example was cited by the London Financial Times of September 26, 1921, which revealed that even at that time, half a dozen men at the top of the big five banks could upset the whole fabric of government finance by refraining from renewing treasury bills. All those who have sought dictatorial control over modern nations have understood the necessity of a central bank. When the League of Just Men hired a hack revolutionary named Karl Marx to write a blueprint for conquest called the Communist Manifesto, the fifth plank read, Centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank, the state capital, and an exclusive monopoly. Lenin later said that the establishment of a central bank was 90% of communizing a country. Such conspirators knew that you cannot take control of a nation without military force unless that nation has a central bank through which you can control its economy. The anarchist ba Bakunin sarcastically remarked about the followers of Karl Marx. They have one foot in the bank and one foot in the socialist movement. The international financiers set up their own front man in charge of each of Europe's central banks. Professor Quigley reports, It must not be felt that these heads of the world's chief central banks were themselves substantive powers in world finance. They were not. Rather, they were the technicians and agents of the dominant investment bankers of their own countries, who had raised them up and were perfectly capable of throwing them down. The substantive financial powers of the world were in the hands of these investment bankers, also called international or merchants bankers, who remain largely behind the scenes in their own unincorporated private banks. These formed a system of international corporation and national dominance, which was more private, more powerful, and more secret than that of their agents in, their, in the central banks. Dr. Quigley also reveals that the international bankers who owned and controlled the banks of England and France maintained their power even after those banks were theoretically socialized. Naturally, those who controlled the central banks of Europe were eager from the start to fasten a similar establishment on the United States. In their earliest days, the Founding Fathers had been conscious of attempts to, to control America through money manipulation, and, their, and they carried on a running battle with their inter international bankers. Thomas Jefferson wrote to John Adams, I sincerely believe with you that banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies. But even though America did not have a central bank after President Jackson abolished it in 1836, the European financiers and their American agents managed to obtain a great deal of control over our monetary system. Gustavus Mayers, in, in MS History of the Great American Fortunes, reveals, Under the surface, the Rothschilds long had a powerful influence in dictating American financial laws. The law records show that they were powers in the old Bank of the United States, abolished by Andrew Jackson. During the 19th century, the leading financiers of the metropolitan East often cut one another's financial throats. But as their western and rural victims started to organize politically, the robber barons saw that they had a community of interest toward which they must work together to protect themselves from thousands of irate farmers and up-and-coming competitors. This diffusion of economic power was one of the main factors stimulating the demands for a central bank by would-be business and financial monopolists. In years of plunder, Proctor Hansel writes of this era, Among the Morgans, Kuhn Loebs, and other similar pillars of the industrial order, there was less disposition to become involved in disagreements that led to financial dislocation. A community of interest came into being with results that were highly beneficial. But aside from the major eastern centers, most American bankers and their customers still distrusted the whole concept. In order to show the hinterlands, they were going to need a central banking system. The international bankers created a series of panics as a demonstration of their power, a warning of what could happen would happen unless the rest of the bankers got into line. 
man in charge of conducting these lessons was J. Pierpont Morgan, American born but educated in England and Germany. Morgan is referred to, to by many, including Congressman Louis McFadden, the maker who for ten years headed the House Banking and Currency Committee, as the top American agent of the English Rothschilds. By the turn of the century, J.P. Morgan was already an old hand at creating artificial panics. Such affairs were well coordinated. Senator Robin Owen, a co-author of the Federal Reserve Act, who later deeply regretted his role, testified before a congressional committee that the bank he owned received from the National Bankers Association what came to be known as the Panic Circular of 1893. It stated, You will at once retire one-third of your circulation and call it one-half of your loans. Historian Frederick Lewis Allen tells in Life magazine of April 25, 1949, of Morgan's role in spreading rumors about the insolvency of the Knockerbacher Bank and the Trust Company of America, which rumors triggered the 1907 panics. In answer to the question, did Morgan participate in the panic, Allen reports, Oakley Tom, the president of that particular trust company, testified later before a congressional committee that his bank had been subjected to only moderate withdrawals that he had not applied for help, and that it was the Morgan's sore point statement alone that has caused the run on his bank. From this testimony, plus the disciplinary measures taken by the clearinghouse against the Hines and Morris and Thomas Banks, plus other fragments of supposedly pertinent evidence, certain chroniclers have arrived at the ingenious conclusion that the Morgan interests took advantage of the unsettled conditions during the autumn of 1907 to precipitate the panic, guiding it shrewdly as it progressed, so that it would kill off rival banks and consolidate the preeminence of the banks within the Morgan orbit. The panic which Morgan had created, he proceeded to end almost single-handedly. He had made his point. Frederick Allen explains, The lesson of the panic of 1907 was clear, though not for some six years was it destined to be embodied in legislation. The United States gravely needed a central banking system. The man who was to play the most significant part in providing America with that central bank was Paul Warburg, who, along with his brother Felix, had immigrated to the United States from Germany in 1902. They left Brother Max, later a major financier of the Russian Revolution, at home in Frankfurt to run the family bank, him and Warburg and company. Paul Warburg married Ni Nina Loeb, daughter of Solomon Loeb of Kuhn, Loeb and Company, America's most powerful international banking firm. Brother Felix married Frida Schiff, daughter of Jacob Schiff, the ruling power behind Kuhn Loeb. Stephen Birmingham writes in his authoritative Our Crowd, In the 18th century, the Schiffs and Rothschilds shared a double house. In Frankfurt, Schiff reportedly bought his partnership in Kuhn Loeb with Rothschild money. Both Paul and Felix Warburg became partners in Kuhn Loeb and Company. In 1907, the year of the Morgan precipitated panic, Paul Warburg began spending almost all of his time writing and lecturing on the need for bank reform. Kuhn Loeb and Company was sufficiently public spirited that the matter to keep him on salary at five hundred thousand per year, while for the next six years he donated his time to the public good. Working with Warburg in promoting his banking reform was Nelson Aldrich, known as Morgan's floor broker in the Senate. Aldrich's daughter, Abby, married John D. Rockefeller, Jr., the current governor of New York, is named for his maternal grandfather. After the Panic of 1907, Aldrich was appointed by the Senate to head the National Monetary Commission. Although he had no technical knowledge of banking, Aldrich and his entourage spent nearly two years and $300,000 of the taxpayers' money being wined and dined by the owners of Europe's central banks as they toured the continent studying central banking. When the Commission returned from its luxurious junket, it ha held no meetings and made no report for nearly two years. But Senator Aldrich was busy arranging things. Together with Paul Warburg and other international bankers, he staged one of the most important secret meetings in the history of the United States. Rockefeller agent Frank Vanderlip admitted, many years later in his memoirs, Despite my views about the value to society of greater publicity for the affairs of corporations, there was an occasion near the close of 1910 when I was as secretive indeed as furtive as any conspirator. I do not feel it 
is any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. The secrecy was well warranted. A stake was control over the entire economy. Senator Aldrich had issued confidential invitations to Henry P. Davison of J.P. Morgan & Company, Frank A. Vanderlip, president of the Rockefeller-owned National City Bank, A. Piat Andrew, assistant secretary of the Treasury, Benjamin Strong of Morgan Bankers Trust Company, and Paul Warburg. They were all to accompany him to Jekyll Island, Georgia, to write the final recommendations of the National Monetary Commission report. At Jekyll Island, writes B.C. Forbes and his men who are making America, after a general discussion, it was decided to drop certain broad principles on which all could agree. Every member of the group voted for a central bank as being the ideal cornerstone um, for any banking system. Warburg stressed that the name central bank must be avoided at all cost. It was decided to promote the scheme as a regional reserve system with four, later twelve, branches in different sections of the country. The conspirators knew that the New York Bank would dominate the rest, which would be marble, white elephants, to deceive the public. Out of the Jekyll Island meeting came the completion of the Monetary Commission report and the Aldrich Bill. Warburg had proposed the bill be designated the Federal Reserve System, but Aldrich insisted his own name was already associated in the public mind with the banking reform, it would be it would arouse suspicion if a bill were introduced that did not bear his name. However, Aldrich's name attached to the bill proved to be the kiss of death, since any law bearing his name was so obviously a project of the international bankers. When the Aldrich bill could not be pushed through Congress, a new strategy had to be devised. The Republican Party was too closely connected with Wall Street. The only hope for a central bank was to disguise it and have it put through by the Democrats as a measure to strip Wall Street of its power. The opportunity to do this came with the approach of the 1912 presidential election. Republican President William Howard Taft, who had turned against the Aldrich Bill, seemed a surefire bet for re-election until Taft's predecessor, fellow Republican Teddy Roosevelt, agreed to run on the ticket of the Progressive Party. In America's 60 families, Fernand Lundberg acknowledges, As soon as Roosevelt signified that he would again challenge Taft, the president's defeat was inevitable. Throughout the three-cornered fight, Taft, Roosevelt, Wilson, Roosevelt had Morgan agents Frank Musney and George Perkins constantly at his heels, supplying money, going over his speeches, bringing people from Wall Street in to help, and, in general, carrying the entire burden of the campaign until against Taft. Perkins and J.P. Morgan and company were the substance of the Progressive Party. Everything else was trimming. In short, most of Roosevelt's campaign fund was supplied by the two Morgan hatchet men who were seeking Taft's scalp. The Democrat candidate, Woodrow Wilson, was equally the property of Morgan. Dr. Gabriel Colco, in his The Triumph of Conservatism, reports, In late 1907, he, Wilson, supported the Aldrich Bill on banking and was full of praise for Morgan's role in American society. According to Lundberg, for nearly 20 years before his nomination, Woodrow Wilson had moved in the shadow of Wall Street. Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt proceeded to whistle stop the country trying to outdo each other in florid and hypocritical denunciations of the Wall Street Money Trust, the same group of insiders which was financing the campaigns of both. Dr. Kolko goes on to tell us that at the beginning of 1912, banking reform seemed a dead issue. The banking reform movement had neatly isolated itself. Wilson resurrected the issue and promised the country a money system free from domination by the international bankers of Wall Street. Moreover, the Democrat platform expressly stated, we are opposed to the Aldrich plan for a central bank, but the big boys knew who they had bought. Among the international financiers who contributed heavily to the Wilson campaign, in addition to those already named, were Jacob Schiff, Bernard Baruch, Henry Morgenthau, Thomas Fortune Ryan, and New York Times publisher Adolf Oakes. The insider sheepdog who controlled Wilson and guided the program through Congress was the mysterious Colonel Edward Mandel House. The British educated son of a representative of England's financial interests in the American South, the title was honorary. House never served in the military. He was strictly a behind the scenes wire puller and in regard and is regarded by many historians 
as the real president of the United States during the Wilson years. House authored a book, Philip Drew, Administrator, in which he wrote of establishing socialism as dreamed by Karl Marx. As steps toward his goal, House, both in his book and in real life, called for passage of a graduated income tax and a central bank providing a flexible, inflatable paper currency. The graduated income tax and a central bank are two of the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto. In his The Intimate Papers of Colonel House, Professor Charles Seymour refers to the colonel as the unseen guardian angel of the Federal Reserve Act. Seymour's work contains numerous documents and records showing constant contact between House and Paul Warburg during the, while the Federal Reserve Act was being prepared and steered through Congress. Biographer George Vierek assures us that the Schiffs, the Warburgs, the Kahn, the Rockefellers, and the Morgans put their faith in House. Their faith was amply rewarded. In order to support the fiction that the Federal Reserve Act was a people's bill, the insider financiers put up a smokescreen of opposition to it. It was strictly a case of briar rabbit begging not to be thrown into the briar patch. Both Aldrich and Vanderlip denounced what in actuality was their own bill. Nearly 25 years later, Frank Vanderlip admitted, Now, although the Aldrich Federal Reserve Plan was defeated when it bore the name Aldrich, nevertheless, its essential points were all contained in the plan that finally was adopted. Taking advantage of Congress's desire to adjourn for Christmas, the Federal Reserve Act was passed on December 22, 1913 by a vote of 298 to 60 in the House and in the Senate by a majority of 43 to 25. Wilson had fulfilled to the insiders the pledge he had made in order to become president. Warburg told House, Well, it hasn't got quite everything we want, but the lack can be adjusted later by administrative process. There was genuine opposition to the act, but it could not match the power of the bill's advocates. Conservative Henry Cobot, Cobot Lodge Sr. proclaimed with such, with great foresight, The bill as it stands seems to me to open the way to a vast inflation of currency. I do not like to think that any law can be passed which will make it possible to submerge the gold standard in a flood of irredeemable paper currency. Congressional Record, June 10, 1932 after the vote, Congressman Charles A. Lindbergh, Sr., father of the famous aviator, told Congress, This act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the President signs this act, the invisible government by the money power proven to exist by the money trust investigation will be legalized. This is the Aldrich Bill in disguise. The new law will create inflation whenever the trusts want inflation. The Federal Reserve Act was and still is hailed as a victory of democracy over the money trust. Nothing could be further from the truth. The whole central bank concept was engineered by the very group it was supposed to strip of power. The myth that the money trust had been defrocked should have been exploded when Paul Warburg was appointed to the first Federal Reserve Board, a board which was handpicked by Colonel House. Paul Warburg relinquished his $500,000 a year job as Kuhn Loeb partner to take a $12,000 a year job with the Federal Reserve. The accidentalists who teach in our universities would have you believe that he did it because he was a public spirited citizen and the man who served as chairman of the New York Federal Reserve Bank during its early critical years was the same Benjamin Strong of the, of the Morgan Interest who accompanied Warburg, Davison, Vanderlip, et al. to Jekyll Island. Georgia to draft the Aldrich Bill. How powerful is our central bank? The Federal Reserve controls our money supply and interest rates and thereby manipulates the entire economy creating inflation or deflation, recession or boom, and sending the stock market up or down at whim. The Federal Reserve is so powerful that Congressman Wright Patman, chairman of the Federal House Banking Committee, maintains, in the United States t today we have in effect two governments. We have the duly constituted government, then we have an independent, uncontrolled, and uncoordinated government in the Federal Reserve System, operating the money powers which are reserved to Congress by the Constitution. Neither presidents, congressmen, nor secretaries of the Treasury direct the Federal Reserve. In the matters of money, the Federal Reserve directs them. The uncontrolled power of the Fed was admitted by Secretary of the Treasury, David M. Kennedy, 
in an interview for the May 5, 1969 issue of U.S. News and World Report. Question. Do you approve of the latest credit tightening mo moves? Answer. It's my job to approve or it's not my job to approve or disapprove. It is the action of the Federal Reserve. And curiously enough, the Federal Reserve System has never been audited and has firmly resisted all attempts by House Banking Committee Chairman Wright Patman to have it audited. How successful was the Federal Reserve System then? Depends on your point of view. Since Woodrow Wilson took his oath of office, the national debt has risen from one billion to four hundred fifty five billion. The total amount of interest paid since then to the international bankers holding that debt is staggering. With interest having become the third largest item in the federal budget, interest on the national debt is now $22 billion every year, and climbing steeply as inflation pushes up the interest rate on government bonds. Meanwhile, our gold is mortgaged by to European central banks, and our silver has all been sold. With economic catastrophe imminent, only a blind disciple of the accidental theory of history could believe that all of this has occurred by coincidence. When the Federal Reserve System was foistered on unsuspecting American public, there were absolute guarantees that there would be no more boom and bust econ economic cycles. The men who, behind the scenes, were pushing the central bank concept for the international bankers faithfully promised that from then on there would be only steady growth and perpetual prosperity. However, Congressman Charles A. Lindbergh Sr. accurately proclaimed, from now on, depressions will be scientifically created. Using a central bank to create alternate periods of inflation and deflation and thus whipsawing the public for vast profits have been worked out by the international bankers to an exact science. Having built the Federal Reserve as a tool to consolidate and control wealth, the international bankers were now ready to make a, a major killing. Between 1923 and 1929, the Federal Reserve expanded, inflated, the money supply by 62 percent. Much of this new money was used to bid the stock market up to dizzying heights. At the same time that enormous amounts of credit money were being made available, the mass media began to ballyhoo tales of the instant riches who made in the stock market, according to, to Fernand Lundberg. For profits to be made on these funds, the public had to be induced to spe speculate, and it was so induced by misleading newspaper accounts many of them bought and paid for by the brokers that operated the pools. The House hearings on stabilization of the purchasing power of the dollar disclosed evidence in 1928 that the Federal Reserve Board was working closely with the heads of European central banks. The committee warned that a major crash had been planned in 1927. At a secret luncheon of the Federal Reserve Board and heads of the European central banks, the committee warned the international bankers were tightening the noose. Morgan Montague Norman, governor of the Bank of England, came to Washington on February 6, 1929 to confer with Andrew Mellon, secretary of the Treasury. On November 11, 1927, the Wall Street Journals described Mr. Norman as the currency dictator of Europe. Professor Carroll quickly notes that Norman, a close confidant of J.P. Morgan, admitted, I hold the hegemony of the world. Immediately after this mysterious visit, the Federal Reserve Board reversed its easy money policy and began raising the discount rate. The balloon which had been inflated constantly for nearly seven years was about to be exploded. On October 24th, the feathers hit the fan. Writing in the United States, unresolved monetary and political problems, William Bryan describes what's, what happened. When everything was ready, the New York financiers started calling 24-hour broker call loans. This meant that the stockbrokers and the customers had to dump their stock on the market in order to pay the loans. This naturally collapsed the stock market and brought a banking collapse all over the country because the banks not owned by the oligarchy were heavily involved in broker call claims at this time, and bank runs soon exhausted their coin and currency and they had to close. The Federal Reserve System would not come to their aid, although they were instructed under the law to maintain an elastic currency. The investing public, including most stockbrokers and bankers, took a horrendous blow in the crash, but not the insiders. They were either out of the market or had sold short so that the market so that they made enormous profits as the Dow Jones plummeted. For those who knew the, the score, a comment by Paul Warburg had provided the warning to sell. That signal came on March 9, 1929, when the Financial Chronicle quoted Warburg as giving this sound advice. 
If orgies of unrestricted speculation are permitted to spread too far, the ultimate collapse is certain to bring about a general depression involving the whole country. Sharpies were, were later able to buy back these stocks at a 90% discount from their former highs. To think that the scientifically engineered crash of 29 was an accident or the result of stupidity defies all logic. The international bankers who promoted the inflationary policies and pushed the propaganda which pumped up the stock market represented too many generations of accumulated expertise to have blundered into the Great Depression. Congressman Lewis McFadden, chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee, commented, It, the Depression, was not accidental. It was a carefully contrived occurrence. The international bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair here so that they might emerge as the rulers of us all. Although we have not had another depression for the magnitude of that which followed 1929, we have since suffered regular recessions. Each of these has followed a period in which the Federal Reserve tromped down hard on the money accelerator and then slammed on the brakes. Since 1929, the following recessions have been created by such manipulation. 1936-37, to 37, stock prices fell 50%. 1948, stock prices dropped 16%. 1953, stock declined 13%. 1956 to 1957, the market dipped 13%. 1957, late in the year, the market plunged 19%. 1960, the market was off 17%. 1966, stock market, stock prices plummeted 25%. 1970, the market plunged over 25%. Chart 5, based on one appearing in the highly respected financial publication indicator digest of June 24, 1969, shows the effects on the Dow Jones Industrial Average of Federal Reserve policies of explaining or restricting the monetary supply. This is how the stock market is manipulated and how depressions or recessions are scientifically created. If you have inside knowledge as to which way the Federal Reserve policy is going to go, you can make a ton of money. The members of the Federal Reserve Board are appointed by the President for 14-year terms. Since these positions control the entire economy of the country, they are far more important than cabinet positions. But who has ever heard of any of them except possibly Chairman Ar Ar Arthur Burns? These appointments, which should be extensively debated by the Senate, are routinely approved. But here, as in Europe, these men are mere figureheads, put in their positions on the behest of the international bankers who finance the presidential campaigns of both political parties. And Professor Quigley revel reveals that these international bankers who owned and controlled the banks of England and France maintained their power even after those banks were theoretically socialized. The American system is slightly different, but the net effects is the same, ever-increasing debt requiring ever-increasing interest payments, inflation, periodic scientifically created depressions and recessions. The end result, if the insiders have their way, will be the dream of Montague Norman of the Bank of England, that the hegemony of world finance should reign supreme over everyone, everywhere, as one whole supernational control mechanism.